Hi, and welcome to the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast brought to you by Provenzano's Deli in West Haven, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us as we're broadcasting live today here on Facebook. You can also listen to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Today, we are celebrating Cinco de Mayo at home with our guest, Ted Hotelling, the men's basketball coach at the University of New Haven. Again, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Z and J Dub podcast, part of the Charger Nation Network. I'm glad you're joining us today here on Cinco de Mayo. Dr. Z, happy Cinco de Mayo to you. How are you doing today? Hey, J Dub, it's one of my favorite days. And my family participates uh, wholeheartedly in the uh, Mexican food fest that goes on today. Well, that's great. It's a great day for all of us to celebrate uh, Mexican heritage, whether we're Mexican or not, that's for sure. Yep. So today, today is is Cinco de Mayo. That means yesterday was May the fourth, as in Star Wars Day. May the fourth <laughs> be with you, Doctor Z. Are you a big fan of Star Wars? You know, I, I think a lot of us were probably watching uh, ESPN last night and the, the the Last Dance, and we'll probably talk about that later today. But uh, they had the 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 musician come on and do the the rap montage about it, and it got me to thinking about uh, Star Wars. And I I'm I'm not a a Trekkie. I'm not a sci-fi guy at all, but I think I was nine or 10 years old when my older brother took me to the original Star Wars uh, movie. And I just thought that was, it blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like that. You know, I, I followed up with, you know, the return of the Jedi and the empire strikes back. But after that, I've seen a few with my kids, but kind of lost touch. Uh, so I think in this uh, time we're living in, I Googled the Star Wars whatever and learned that there were three sets of trilogies is that how it works straight up correct yeah we had started out back uh, way back in 1977 they actually started it with the middle so episode four yeah. a new hope that's when they introduced all the characters that we know and love so well and they went empire strikes back in 1980 return of the jedi in 1983 and then george lucas went back to the beginnings for episodes one two and three in the late 90s and early 2000s and then they capped it off with the most recent trilogy, episodes seven, eight, and nine. You know, I've often thought if these days never come, maybe this is the time to do it, right? Yeah. That I would take a day and watch all of them, you know, uh, uh, or even closer to my 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 likes and dislikes. I'd love to watch all the Rockies in, in order. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would certainly take up a lot of time. I actually, I actually, because we talked about this with, with Dave Fogno, our strength and conditioning coach, a couple of weeks ago, Foggy, and he's obviously such a big Rocky fan. Rocky IV is his favorite movie, as he told us, and he gets down and does the push-ups during the training montage. Yep. I actually checked out after Rocky IV. I never saw Rocky V, and I've not seen any of the new ones with, the, with that, that focuses on Apollo Creed's son. Have you seen any, any of the new ones? I have. I've seen them all, and okay. uh, I have my favorites and my least favorites. I, I still love the original Rocky. I watch it at least once a year. And and uh, I remember writing down in my intro to lit class, and I was an English major back in college, one of the few football players that did that. Uh, but my intro to lit class, the, the teacher who still uh, sends me notes, she asked what our favorite movie was, and I wrote Rocky, which I think greatly disappointed her. But <laughs> love that movie. And the last one, with I've, I, it might be right up there in my top two or three. Uh, like you, you said you liked Rocky Three. There was I something did. about the music and Mr. T and the theme yeah. that I did too. There was something about that one that really grabbed me. But I agree with Foggy on the the workout montage in uh, in Four that was pretty moving. Yeah, it, it's hard not to get pumped up watching any of those Rocky movies with the montages and the music, right? You, we all want to go up and run the steps of the Philadelphia Library. <laughs> I've actually never done that, but I know everybody does. You yeah. have you ever done that? Any I never have, but it's on the bucket list. Yeah. I think what was probably the worst thing is, and it's probably happened to so many people, we could probably find it online, people running up the steps and, you know, face planting, right? Or tripping. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. That's a uh, lot of steps. 
You know, it's funny. You just struck a memory. We were doing a Zoom call with some of our donors the other night, and my youngest son is is home with us uh, uh, during this time, studying online, and he slipped going down the stairs. And and you heard, you know, these Zoom calls bring on all kind of different uh, uh, experiences. Everyone's, like, is everything okay? You know, you heard this two hundred pound kid bouncing down the stairs. It was. Uh, it, it teaches you to move into the the office and not do it in the living room. Yeah, it, it's. Better. It's been a challenge for all of us doing this. I'm actually here at the house today by myself. Uh, my wife's working today, but we don't we don't have dogs. We don't have kids, so we don't have a lot of the distractions a lot of people do. I know with my students, I was I had a, a final last night in uh, or a, a rehearsal last night in one of my my night classes, and the student was giving a presentation on Zoom, and her br younger brother was making noise in the background. She had to go stop you know, go off camera and come back. And then she kind of jokingly said, well, I'll kill him later. So <laughs> that's the great thing about families all, all living together. That's, that's for sure. What's, what's it been like for having your family? Your family has been with you now for what, a, a little more than a week, I think, since you moved them, right? Yeah, a little more than a week. I and mean, I really appreciate that question, J-Dub. And it, it uh, if I had a message for, for anyone out there that, that, that I've learned this past year, it's just how important family is and, and people are. You know, I've I've been in in New Haven now, uh, West Haven, Brantford, uh, since August fifteenth. We've covered that in the last few podcasts, and the first eight months or seven months were, you know, I I live alone, but you you come home to sleep, but I'd stay at the office from, you know, eight in the morning till ten at night. Uh, might grab a bite to eat with with some friends and and whatnot, and so it didn't seem that different. But once we all were quarantined, I spent a week here by myself and then, as, as, as you know, went home to, to uh, finish up on the house and move the furniture here. And then I quarantined again for a month by myself here. And I don't recommend that for anybody to do that alone. I would chase my neighbor. I'd see him walk out on the porch I'm pointing, pointing to right now. And I'd sprint on my porch just to say hi. Uh, <laughs> people need people. And yeah. I, I, nobody's enjoying their spouse and, and, and one of our children can't wait to get the other here for part of the summer. The other two, no one's enjoying them more than me. I, I, I hear stories about people who are getting on one another's nerves. Maybe I'm getting on their nerves, but I can't get enough of them right now. Well, I, that's great. Again, cause you had been separated for so long. It's great to have them back in the mix and I'm sure they feel the same way about you, which leads me to my next question. Of course, we're, we're looking at Mother's Day. All of a sudden, it's Sunday. That's hard to believe. It's 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 already upon us. And Shane, we don't get here without our mothers, certainly. And I would say also for you know your wife, the mother of your children. You have three children. You know they play such a huge role in in our lives. My mom and and my dad, thank God, both still alive. Uh, they're watching back home in in Middletown, Rhode Island, where I grew up. Uh, my mom, Mary, was an educator. And I, I guess I'm kind of following in, in her footsteps here teaching as an adjunct professor at the University of New Haven. But my mom grew up in Maine and and uh, has been in Rhode Island now since the 1960s when she was a teacher. She was back in those days, Dr. Z, she, was a, she had to be a physical education teacher, a health teacher, and a guidance counselor because you couldn't oh. just do one or the other, right? Yeah. Now everything is so specialized. Back then, she had to wear so many different hats and she actually taught at you know, the high school level and, and retired from teaching in the early 1970s when, when I was born and then my sisters were born. But you know they're so important to, to all of us. My mom is, is the best person in the world. I always say she's the best mother in the whole wide world. And you know a lot of my personality is, is after my mom. And I've, I've been very grateful to, to have such great role models uh, in my mom and my dad. They've been married for, they got married in 1967. So in June next month they'll celebrate their 53rd wedding anniversary. So that's pretty cool. Tell us about tell us about a little bit about uh, about Mother's Day and what it means for you. Not only you know because you know certainly you think of your mom and then you think of in your case your wife. You know uh, both my parents passed about two years ago, and while that could sound sad, they had great long lives together and married over 60 years and very similar to yours. Uh, both my mom and dad were educators. They were farm kids out in the middle of Kansas that became teachers. My dad was a coach and eventually they both became professors of education. And uh, it's just an extremely close relationship. Uh, I think that happened a lot back then. Not that it doesn't now, but we get so distracted uh, in, in our society today. We're all learning that. You know, We're seeing all these little clips we're getting about, hey, maybe we're learning what's important again. 
but my parents were inseparable and, and wrote eight educational books together in, in their time and, and uh, had the same career path, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so very grateful to them. It's hard to talk about my mom without my dad and vice versa. Uh, in, in my own little world now, my, my wife and I made a decision years ago when I was coaching college football and then moved into university and athletic administration that she would, would stay home with the kids. And she substitute taught and did things like that over the years and whatnot. But she did a great job raising the kids and, and they're so devoted to her. And, uh, I just moved her, uh, you know, 1200 miles away from them and they'll come join us. And, uh, one w- is with us now, as I referenced, and the other two will be here soon for a, for a month or so. But, uh, uh, I don't want to spoil it in case she watches this, but I'm so proud of them. But they're, they're at the age where I was getting texts from them this morning, planning something for her. And that, that made my day that it's no longer dad having to reach out and go buy the cards and go do this and that. Don't know that you can buy the cards right now. So we're right. going to have to be creative. And, and I think this will be a very unique Mother's Day. And I think a lot of mothers will find out just how valued they are because people are going to go to great lengths to, to, to make sure that message gets across this year. No, no question. It's well said, Dr. Z. I'll, I'll definitely call my mom on, on Mother's Day. I haven't seen my parents since right before Christmas. And they were in Florida for, you know, they go to Florida for the winter for a few months and then the whole coronavirus pandemic hit. And then they came back to Rhode Island and obviously they're back there and we're here and in Connecticut. So at some point we'll, we'll get a chance to celebrate uh, Mother's Day and all the other holidays we might end up missing along the way. But, you know, we don't ever let any Mother's Day go by without thanking our mothers for everything that they've done for us. And, and again, certainly not only, you know, your mom, but, uh, you know, your father and, and, and your wife as well for everything that she's done for you and the kids. Not easy being a coach's wife, right? No, no, she uh, adapted. Well, we were dating and I remember sitting down on a curb one night and said, Hey, here's, you know, this is what I do for a living. And this is what I'm always going to do. And are you sure you're up for this? And, uh, she said she was in and, you know, umpteen moves later, she's been there every step of the way. And, you know, when we moved to, to Connecticut, at least I did back, you know, nine months ago, ten months ago. Uh, you know, folks in New England, I, I love the way they 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 ask their question. It reminds me of when I moved to Wyoming. So how do you like it here? And they never know what you're going to say. And I have found the people to be extraordinarily welcoming and and enjoyable. And and I every time I said I, I said, and the food's pretty good too. And yeah. the view, I I I have this you know view of the Thimble Islands here that anyone would 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 you know love to have. But my point is, I just brought my wife 1,200 miles to be a part of this. And we were talking about it just yesterday. And I said something about the Midwest. And she goes, well, I want to enjoy this. You know, I just got here. And, you know, our place in, in West Haven, I go back and forth right now. And our place in West Haven is a block from Lake Street Beach. It's gorgeous. And uh, can't wait to, for things to open up and be able to go down there and play a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's a little bit about us. And again, we we tip our hat to our moms. And and again, uh, Mrs. Dr. Z, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. we can call her. So speak, as we said, it's tough to be a coach's wife. It's it's certainly tough to be a coach. But uh, this guy's made a living out of, of doing a phenomenal job at the University of New Haven. He just finished up his 10th year as our men's basketball coach at UNH. Ted Hotelling is in the green room backstage. We bring him out here to join the Dr. Z and J-Dub podcast. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, J-Dub. Hi, Dr. Z, how are you? Hey, Coach, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Yeah, uh, staying at home, hanging out with the family. So we said it's it's tough to be a coach's wife. You you have a family. What's what's it like for, for your wife and kids? Uh, you know, I think it's pretty interesting. It's not a dull life, that's for sure. Um, I think they get used to miss me a little bit, whether it's on the road recruiting or taking road trips. Uh, it's been a little bit easier transition being at New Haven. Several of the other stops, I was gone for maybe five days at a time, which when you have small children at the time, my kids were, you know, under the age of two, that's a little bit more challenging, but, uh, yeah, it, it brings a lot of, uh, a lot of surprises along the way, a lot of fun. And I think they enjoy the games just as much as I do. What's it been like for you being back home with them now? Cause again, you say you're on the road quite a bit during the season and now we're all back home for a while, staying safe. What's it been like to kind of reconnect with them? Yeah, it's been great. Dr. Z and I actually, spoke about this maybe a couple of weeks ago. It reminds me of when I was a child. So, you know, there were no cell phones when I was growing up and, uh, you know, you had dinner at the table with your family and then you probably went back outside and played with your brother and sister and hope your dad finished the dishes quick enough to, to get outside and hit you some fly balls. 
but it's been really good. It's, uh, you know, I think we've been in quarantine for over 50 days now. Mm-hmm. And the one thing it's done is I, I think we've actually become come closer. So my son is 13. My daughter is 12. They're at an age where they can do things on their own. But it's been a lot of fun just being around each other on a daily basis and, uh, you know, eating dinner together, having breakfast together and uh, kind of going through the same experience. Coach and, and Dr. Z, it's hard to believe, but as, as Ted just referenced, it's been almost two months since we've been without a live sporting event. And for us at the University of New Haven, the, maybe the last one was on uh, Saturday, March the 7th. And, and that was the NE10 championship game between the University of New Haven and, and St. Anselm up in, up in New Hampshire. The Hawks beat the Chargers 65-63 in, in overtime. Obviously, Ted, you were on the sidelines. Dr. Z, you were in the stands. Ted, let's start with you. What what do you remember about that game? Yeah, our guys were tired. <laughs> we had we had a lot of overtime games leading up to the to St. Anselm. I think our guys were really confident. You know, I think they they ended the season really well. I think the nice part about that part of the season was, you know, our guys were really playing well and they really, you know, owned the games, if that makes any sense. They were making good plays and really working hard together. So we actually felt really good going into the game. Um, you know, the Stonehill game, uh, the game before we had five guys play almost 50 minutes, uh, four guys play over 50 and Devontae Thomas played 49. So we were a little bit on fumes at that point, but considering the magnitude of the game, our guys were excited. I thought we played really well, probably played well enough to win. Uh, you know, we got a little lucky in the Bentley game with a missed layup that allowed us to play a few more games. And this game, just not as lucky, uh, at the end to, to make a shot, maybe just to, uh, to get us to that championship. Dr. Z, what do you remember as a as a uh, uh, as as a fan in the stands? So, ironically, J Dub, you know that's we'll be having other coaches on this podcast throughout the year and whatnot. But I asked uh, Coach Hotelling to be on here first for the very reason you you alluded to. That was the last sporting event I got to be a part of, and uh, I'll tell you what that tournament run was something. As, as as Coach was talking, I was replaying. I even went back to the Lemoyne game in my mind. And uh, where I, I was in a car watching the, 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 and I should have been doing this. I had the phone down by my stick shift and, and watching that game that, that you know, we were up by so much and they came back and we kind of won it at the end. And it was, it was a gut wrench. I called coach right afterwards and said, don't ever do that again. That was brutal. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the Bentley game, uh, you know, John Mays, who's backstage and I got to go to that. And, and again, another nail biter. Uh, to win at their place. And then the next game was at Stonehill, which I'll, I'll go back to. And then finally the, the championship game, which I'm sure is a dagger in coach's heart. Anytime you, they led most of the game and lost by two, you know, and it could have gone either way, anytime, just a phenomenal game. That in and of itself was a special game, but I'm going to drop back to the, the, the semifinal game and coach ask you to almost go play by play through some of this because I've been in this business 30 years. I've gotten to see some phenomenal basketball. And, and several several of those games are coming to my mind right now. Been at Final Fours, been at, you know, all kinds of, of tournament games, et cetera. But that Stonehill game ranks in the top two or three in my lifetime of, of witnessing. I'd like you to take us through the close of, of, of regulation and then the close of each overtime and then I'll just throw in kind of my fan perspective of I, I literally I couldn't believe what I saw. Yeah, it, it was uh, it's one of the best games, if not the best game I've been a part of, whether it's as a player or as a coach. And uh, I think the one thing that was a big part of the game was it was such a roller coaster ride. There was so many highs where both teams maybe thought they had the game in hand and then a play at the end that, that maybe uh, swung it in the other direction or sent it to overtime. But just the amount of swings in that game were, were pretty incredible. And then how long the game was, it was uh, it just seemed to keep on going. It was actually hard to kind of reference back and, and see, uh, you know, what happened in the first overtime, what happened yeah, in the yeah. second overtime. But, uh, yeah, it was a great game. I think the one thing, I, and I, you've seen enough basketball, you know, when you get to that point in, in the year, it's good players making good plays. And I think more than anything, that Stonehill game, you know, they had a lot of their good players mm-hmm. play well, and our good players played well. And uh, it was fun to watch that as a coach because that's that's what you uh, ideally that's what you want your players to go out there and and uh, and win the game or and, you know in some cases lose the game but that was uh, that was a big part of the game it's just both teams played really really well 
Um, but we, you know, I think we were down seven points with about seven minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, they made a big three. And I think with about five minutes left as well, we were down by five. And we just, you know, we got some big stops. Derek Roland hit some big three pointers. Obviously, Elijah Bailey made a, a ton of big baskets. Um, you know, we missed a lot of free throws, which mm -hmm. probably could have sealed the game, but enabled Stonehill to kind of creep back in. But um, yeah, there was a couple moments there. So it was. Um, it was a minute left. They had the ball. Uh, you know, we had fouls to give. We, we've been one of the better teams in the country at not fouling and actually paid dividends for us because we got the sideline press. So in our sideline press where we, we put Kessley on the ball and, and try and trap the first pass, it actually got us back in the game and then also in the several overtimes actually enabled us to make some baskets. But they missed a big free throw. You know, we had a play given to our team uh, before, so we didn't have to take a timeout. Quayshawn made a great drive down the left side. And Devontre Thomas, who played 49 minutes and played a great game as a freshman, you know, just made a great cut to the basket with a, with a big finish to put it in overtime. But uh, a little fortunate, right? They had a really good free throw shooter shooting free throws that happened to miss a front of a one-on-one. Just gave us a little bit of a window to, uh, to make a play and, and score. But, yeah, big play. And, obviously, uh, our guys were pretty excited after that, after that basket. You know, in my mind, Quayshawn's – shot with 0.5 seconds to go down the corner by our bench. I mean, it looked like he was all corkscrewed up and he shot from behind <laughs> the basket. It wasn't quite that yeah. dramatic. But the thing goes in and, you know, their crowd goes silent and we we know we've got it. And somehow yes. they get the ball out of bounds in front of their bench with 0.5 right. seconds to go. And John looks at me and goes, you know, they're, they could do that tip-in thing. And I'm like, well, what? And they actually <laughs> pull it off to put yeah. it – was that did that put us into the second or the third overtime? I think that put us into the second overtime. Okay. So that was uh yeah, you know what? I'm a little confused there too. Yeah, yeah it was 0.5 seconds left. And I thought uh so they actually called a timeout and threw the ball full court to the sideline. They had tipped we had tipped the ball out, but they yeah. the referees put time on the clock enough for them to get a tip. And uh we tried to zone it up. And I think guys were a little bit nervous about fouling. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're kind of avoiding contact and avoiding the ball. But I've watched that play several times. It was a heck of a play by their, uh, you know, draw, drawn up by the coach. But just yeah. a heck of a tip left-handed to go in. And uh, it's funny to watch the reactions now of the crowd. I think they actually stormed the court. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the coaches and referees are trying to get things back in order. Um, and I, I know when our guys came to the, to the bench, it was like, hey, why not play another one? We've, we've been doing yeah. it enough this, this run yeah. anyway. Let's just play another one. But, yeah, just a heck of a play by them and uh, pretty amazing uh, pretty amazing highlight. You know, it's funny when you talk about that, just the reaction to the crowd. And and I, to give them credit, I've never seen a tip go in like that, you know, from the yeah. lob pass in from the side. And it went up so high on the backboard. I thought it was going to go over the backboard. It just dropped yeah. in perfectly. And yeah. so disappointing for us. But, yeah, okay, let's play a third one. I got so used to going to another overtime. <laughs> when they missed their bask their shot. It's into the third overtime. I mentally thought, "Oh, we're going to a fourth overtime." It didn't yeah. register that. Yeah, I didn't want to. I, I'm glad you wanted to play more. I was actually yeah. done with it. We were, we were, we were pretty good. We were set with that one. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, what an incredible game. And I, you know, you were in the locker room after and got to see how excited our guys were. It's, uh, you know, those are the fun moments when you coach and, you know, you work so hard, 365 days a year, to have moments like that. You know, so it was uh, enjoyable to watch them and enjoyable experience with our players, but. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a pretty incredible game with, and very emotional uh, by the end of it. You know, to put that in perspective, you asked me to come back to the locker room. I'm always careful about that. I only want to come back when the coaches and players ask you. I think that's kind of sacred territory. And having been a former coach, I, you, know, I, you don't always want the administrators hanging around. I'm sensitive to that. But coach said, come on back. And, uh, you know, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's real. That might be the last time I hugged anybody other than my family. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the COVID had just started to get out there. We weren't real sure what it was. And I remember after being hugged by a few of the guys, I'm thinking, well, if they've got it, I've got it. You yeah. know, sweating on each other. And oh, yeah. and that, that seems like a decade ago. Yeah. That it does. It seems actually like a long time ago. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, those, are, those are the good days. Yeah. Dr. yeah. Dr. Z, what was your message to the team after that game? Oh, heck, I stay out of the way, J-Dub. I just watch. Let them celebrate. And, you know, I think that comes from years of being a coach. I, I loved it when our, you know, AD and president would be in the in the locker room and whatnot. But you want them there to experience it. And, and 
it, it was a rare, rare occasion that you had them speak. It just, I just want to be there. It's, it's like watching your own kids have success. You just want to drink it all in. And, and that's really what, uh, watching them, you know, jump all over each other. And, it, you know, I don't care what level you're at, whether it be high school, college, pro, whatever, man, hard earned victories. There's they're just nothing like it. it's why we're in the business we're in. Those yeah. are the, and, and it's not just the victories. Sometimes it's the, the defeats. What's that old, you know, wide world of sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Mm -hmm. yep. I know I'm tagging yep. back here to some older generations, but <laughs> man, you know, you're alive. You know, yeah. it's, we're in an industry, we're in a business. I don't even want to call it a business. We get to do this for a living where we're, you know, you're alive constantly throughout the year because you're winning and losing throughout the year. Yeah. I think sometimes those moments too, you know, you don't need to speak, right? Just the yeah. sheer emotion. Uh, you know, sometimes coaches hop yeah. in there too much. And uh, I think yeah. all the adults in the room kind of let it just happen. And it was, uh, you know, let the kids and enjoy it. And, you know, they were pretty excited. They didn't, they didn't need much, many words from us. You know, Ted, I told uh, J Dub what an avid book reader you are, and I am as well, but you're proving it with your, with your book <laughs> behind you there. I, I have to find a background somehow, some way in the house. So this yeah. is, we all, we, have, we all have our own stations in the house. This has yeah. become mine when, when I do yeah. Zoom calls. You know, so as we talk about that, you and I found a common, common uh, interest in, in the studying of stoicism. In right. the, uh, and, and we both read some of the same books on that. The obstacle is the way and, and so on and so forth. And the daily stoic reader. And, and, and so we'll, Jada, we'll trade these, this, this information back and forth from time to time, but kind of tell the, the folks that are watching uh, what really the underpinnings of stoicism are. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of found it just by reading. And um, I think that's the, the one great thing about reading books is it's a transferable skill, right? You can acquire other skills uh, just by opening up a book and, and reading. Um, and a lot of times for me, it's just led to other things, particularly in my home, my, you know, my, my personal life. Uh, and, you know, as a basketball coach or as a parent or as a husband. Um, but I, I kind of stumbled upon a stoicism and just read more about it. And really what it is, is just you're kind of a neutral, uh, you're in a neutral territory. Uh, you're not emotional about things. When bad things happen, you handle them appropriately. When good things happen, you handle it appropriately. Um, and I think all of us are going to have challenges, right? I know as a basketball coach, um, it may seem small in comparison to now what we're dealing with in the outside world, but you know there are significant challenges to molding a team, uh, dealing with wins and losses, uh, dealing with young men, right? That you're trying to help uh, become better students, become better people. Um, so there is such an emotional uh, aspect to it. Stoicism for me has allowed me just to be centered, be neutral, and to make good decisions um, without, you know, being like a yo-yo, you know? So it's, uh, you know, it's helped me be a better parent. It's helped me be a better husband. Um, and really, uh, it's funny, I'll, I'll actually, before games, uh, when it's really tense, right? It's, it's the lead up to the game is always the hardest part for me as a head coach. You know, I'll just write down lines that I've, I've read from Marcus Aurelius and maybe just think about them in those ways. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great philosophy for me to embrace and just really help me, um, you know, just navigate the navigate life. Yeah. D Dr. Z, it sounds a lot like Nunk Cheppy, doesn't it? I, yeah. You know, I can't believe you, you pulled that out. It really <laughs> is. And, and I know that uh, what, they come from two different um, places in, in, in time, but the reality of it is it, 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 it you know, the whole to begin again, which is what Nunk Cheppy yep. refers right. to. And you just, you know, we in co coaching for years have always told players to flush it. Something bad happens, just flush it. Start up next play. And football is always next play. Uh, you know, in 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 baseball, next man up. You know, it, basketball has its own own uh, uh, vernacular. Um, but it's it, it, that that reminds me, as J Dub says that you do a for certain inner circle of, of friends and colleagues, you do a Friday email that I right. recently have been lucky enough to be a part of, and. You do so much reading and scanning the material. I look forward to the message each Friday. And several weeks ago, you you referenced a uh, counselor that works with the NFL. And uh, I had never, even though I've studied Stoicism, it, he, he said this in a in a in a different manner. Uh, his best advice to NFL players is to be successful on the field of play is not to be too high, not to be too low. Again, back to Nuke Cheppy, but the concept of neutral. And you referenced that earlier, and I I texted you right away and said, wow, I can really use this myself because I've always thought you had to 
be positive, positive, positive. The old Norman Vincent Peale thing that I like so much, the power of positive thinking, but you almost feel guilty when you're not up all the time. Well, the key is not to necessarily be down and negative, although that's going to happen, and you got to lean into it when it happens, but it's a lot easier. We talked about this, J-Dub, with, with the life coach that was on here a few weeks ago. Correct. Just get to neutral. Get to neutral and, and talk about that in terms of coaching and, and how you think that impacts play. Yeah, you know, it's very easy to be negative. And I think, uh, you know, and the book is by Trevor Moen. It, it takes what it takes. It's very easy read. He's a, a life coach. He's worked with Alabama. He's worked with Georgia football. Um, he really works with um, the quarterback from the, uh, from the Seahawks, uh, you know, all the time. So, uh, and really what he's done is he's gone out and sent this message of avoid negativity. It's so easy to be negative as a coach, right? Turnovers. Uh, maybe your expectations aren't being met uh, by, by, by a player you think should be better, whatever it might be, losing, a three-game losing streak. Um, but it's more important to be neutral and then move forward in a neutral way. Not everything is going to be positive, right? If it was always positive, um, it maybe wouldn't be as sincere as uh, you'd like it to be. Um, so being neutral is just in that place where you're just not being pulled by your emotions, uh, whether it's negative or positive. Um, but if you can avoid negativity, uh, which is very hard to do, right? We all go through that. Sometimes you don't get enough sleep sometimes or maybe not enough coffee, so it's a little bit easier. But, yeah, um, yeah avoiding negativity, getting that neutral area um, where it's just, you know, uh, this is what it is and this is what it takes. And I think that's a great lesson for coaches, right? It's, um, you know, you, you talked about the, the wins. Winning is awesome, right? Uh, losing is misery. But you do have to stay in that neutral place so you can get your team to play well in the next game. And uh, that's our goal as coaches. Um, and to be neutral is probably the best way to do it. You know, it's funny. When I was coaching, people would always ask me what my favorite thing was. And they were expecting game day. Now, game day to me was gut-wrenching. I loved yes. practice. I just liked yeah. being with the guys. It's, that's when you got to teach. And, and the camaraderie was so daily. Uh, and so I, I shared this with my own children. And, and, and after I read your, your, your email, and uh, – I told them as they were going through the highs and lows of having to study online, college online, at home, instead of being with their friends, I said, you know, I want you to think about some of the happiest moments in life. They're not the extreme highs and lows. It's when you're just sitting around the room with your friends watching TV. You know how you'll say to someone, hey, what are you thinking? You know, <laughs> I'm not thinking about anything. Those are some of the best moments in life when you're yeah. just with people you love being with at the dinner table you reference, and you're just there. And, and I know people have gotten into this mindfulness lately and, and you know, more the Eastern thought, you know, that which we could all use in the Western world, regardless of what your, your beliefs are, that just being present and mindful and just being in the moment. And, 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 and I now see that as being neutral. It's helped me so much during this time of being, being home and, and being alone. Just, I would just, instead of being down, just slip into neutral and just be. <laughs> yeah. Coach, I, I want to ask you, this is kind of piggybacking off off what Dr. Z said. So you, you've you been away from your team now for almost two months since the loss in the NET, NET, NET 10 championship game. How have you stayed connected with them and what's been your message to them while we've all been at home? Yeah, we, uh, you know, I stay in contact with them a ton just over the phone and through text. I, um, you know, I, uh, Sam Walker wrote a book, Captain's Class, and he talked about charismatic connectors. It's a great, it's a great, um, it's a way, great way to exist as far as how do you connect with your team. So we talk about that with our team all the time. It doesn't take a speech on Zoom to, to rally them up and make them feel good. It just really, it's a daily interaction with your kids, right? And to let them know you're there for them, or if they need something they can call, or even just to say hello for 30 seconds. So, you know, we've, we've been on the phone a lot with them. Um, and then we've done a one week, one day a week, we do a Zoom. We've had some special guests. Uh, we had Jeff Atkins, former great player at New Haven that graduated in 2014. We had Eric Anderson, who's playing overseas in Israel, um, who graduated in 2015. Uh, you know, leading up to the Zoom call, we'll always kind of ask, you know, who do you think the special guest will be? We had a former manager, Tyler Collins, who was working for Disney this past year that, you know, shared some of his experiences out in the working world. And uh, yeah, so it's just been good. And and then we just get on and just tease each other a little bit too. That's always fun as well. So, but uh, yeah, just once a week Zoom, you know, constant daily interaction, text, 
Coach Fogno always hops on our Zoom call, which is great. So we've had uh, weekly challenges. We had the push-up challenge two weeks ago. Um, I barely made it one night. I had to do about 430 <laughs> minutes. Wasn't, wasn't feeling too good the next day. This week it's sit up. So, yeah, we've just been trying to, you know, keep it light, help them as much as they can. And, you know, I think the one thing about kids, they're more resilient than we think. And I think, um, you know, that's what comes through with our guys is they've handled this really, really well. Uh, stoicism, right? The obstacle becomes the way. So this is the obstacle and they've really flourished with their online classes and connecting with each other. And, you know, some guys are telling us what they're working on. They're, you know, they're running, uh, in the neighborhood or shooting baskets in their backyard. So yeah, it's, it's been great to connect. It's been a different way, but it's been, uh, it's been very positive and our guys have handled it really, really well. Speaking of basketball, have you had a chance to watch the last dance, the ESPN documentary about Michael Jordan and the Bulls in that 97, 98 championship season. Oh yeah. I, I, uh, I have the whole family at nine, 9 PM ready to watch so they can watch a big part of my growing up. So, you know, our, our players, uh, grew up with Kobe and LeBron. And if you talk to them about Kobe and LeBron, you can feel their passion and enthusiasm for just what those guys have brought to their lives. Right. Uh, from a cultural perspective, a basketball perspective, all those things. That was Michael Jordan for my generation and uh, was a big part of my life watching those Knicks games and Bulls games. So uh, when Owen, Susan and Keely sit down with me on at nine o'clock, we're totally silent so we can just watch and uh, I can enjoy going back in time a little bit and watching uh, someone I, you know, I, I really emulate and idolize quite a bit. Was he your favorite player growing up? Oh, yeah, it wasn't close. So I, so basketball wasn't on TV much when I grew up. I remember the Big East first kind of came into play in the early 80s, and I fell in love with Pearl Washington. Uh, I watched him on CBS on a Saturday morning and used to walk outside hunched over and try and do all his moves. I was an upstate New York kid. And then, you know, Chris Mullen. Uh, the NBA wasn't on TV very much. You know, it just kind of got on in the early 80s with, with Bird and Magic. So when I was starting to become more involved with basketball, Jordan was at its, uh, was at its peak. So it was – kind of a perfect storm for me to watch this human being do the things that he did. And um, yeah, it, it was uh, phenomenal to watch. You know, J-Dub, we talked about the last dance, I think the last episode, maybe the one before that. And, yeah. and I told you that uh, Doug Collins is a good friend from my days at Illinois State. And I had texted him during it and said, hey, Doug, you're looking good on, on TV <laughs> here. And, you know, he's sent back fun text, but it was neat to watch my wife and my son Jake. Hey, there's Doug. There's Doug. You know, they they didn't know Doug in the day when he had the perm. You know, as a young <laughs> and, uh, so we've had a lot of fun with this. And when they were advertising the last round of the Last Dance, I texted him and said, "Hey, I'm sitting here watching the advertisement. And I'm thinking of you again." And I sent him a copy of our last podcast. Said, "Hey, if you're bored, you might want to look at this." And of course, he came back with some fun stuff. So, so Ted, he may be watching you right now. You know, it's oh. uh, come full circle. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, you maybe, maybe you, old, <laughs> you have to be careful with your old haircuts now. You never know. You have to be. Oh yeah, yeah. Have to be very careful. So that's right. That's right. Maybe Dr. Z can pull some strings. We'll get Doug Collins on the podcast one day. I think that'd be, that'd be some fun storytelling. You know what? You, you mentioned it. I, I, you know, how's that go from your mouth to God's ears? We'll, we'll get Doug on here. He would be a lot of fun. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, hey, speaking of connections, obviously Dr. Z has his connection with, with Doug Collins. We have a, a, a somewhat of a connection as well, because on that 97, 98 championship bulls team was Scott Burrell. Scott yep. Burrell is the basketball coach at Southern Connecticut, which is our big rival. So, Ted, you've coached against Scott. What's that experience been like? Yeah, Scott's been great. You know, I, I've known Scott for a long time. When I when I used to work at Yale, we used to open up the gym on Saturday mornings, and we'd have Vin Baker come in, Scott Burrell. And uh, I wanted to get rid of him so I could be one of the better players, but it didn't work <laughs> out that way. But, uh, yeah, you know what I'd say about Scott? Scott has had a great uh, athletic pass, right? You can start at UConn, obviously an NBA career, and play with the Bulls. But – a uh, really humble person, uh, really genuinely good guy. And uh, it's been fun to compete against him. His teams are always well-prepared. You know, our rivalry with Southern Connecticut across every sport is uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, but, it's, yeah, it's been fun to coach against him. And obviously, uh, known Scott for a long time, so it uh, makes it even better. You, know, you, you mentioned the rivalry. What words would you use to describe the rivalry between New Haven and, and Southern Connecticut and once you're finished answering, I think we'll bring on our producer, Brockby Rob Thompson, because 
Rob is, you know, a, a graduate of UNH, played football as well, so he can speak to that as well. But I want to get your opinion first. That how how would you describe that, or how would you compare that rivalry? Yeah, I think there's a genuine dislike, right? And uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> when people graduate, they kind of, you know, they become friends. But I think while you're attending Southern, while you're attending New Haven, uh, there's a genuine dislike, and uh, it is for bragging rights in the Elm City. So again, I I, I think it's every sport. It's not just basketball, right? You go to the football game, and it's it's packed and it's intense. Um, every time we play at Southern at home, the gym is full. When we go to their place, it's full. So yeah, there's uh, there's obviously a lot of interest uh, from both campuses um, and the games are very intense. We've been fortunate to be you know uh, a good team over the last 10 years and so has Southern. So the games have maybe taken him on more meaning as far as NCAA tournament bids. Uh, in 2014, we actually played him in the championship game of the NA10 tournament. So. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's an intense game. And I think, uh, you know, everybody that comes to New Haven, when you watch the games against Southern Connecticut, whether it's football, it's baseball, softball, lacrosse, you know, there's there's a, a big interest in it and it takes on a little bit more intensity. There's Brock B. Rob. So, uh, first of all, <laughs> good show, everybody, by the way. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, Ted, I want to know, number one, how did you break into the Wallingford Public Library? That's, that's the first <laughs> question. The, 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 well, the, right before the quarantine, you had to go there because they were going to shut it down. Now, yeah. if you think I have a lot of books, you should see my daughter. We probably took, uh, you know, eight bags of books because we knew we were going to be uh, tucked in for a while. So, yeah, yeah. I should start selling them is what I should do. Yeah, they give you a key. They gave you the key <laughs> to the library. Um <clears throat> So if, way too many books in the background for you all, but grad, by the way. So <laughs> um, I want to talk about a little bit. Southern rivalry goes way back anyways, and, and uh, nothing but mutual respect for those guys. There's, you know, it's kind of like when you're in that position, you choose between Southern uh, and, and New Haven, where you're going to go to college. And, um, but they used to be loaded in football and a lot of their sports. And, um, but anyways, I, I, I digress about that. Coach, here's what I want to ask you before we go, because I know we have some time. I uh, don't, don't have much time left. When you talk about connectivity and you're just a master, to me, you're just always been a master communicator and very thoughtful in things that you produce. But um, I, this is interesting to me. How has, and I don't know if I'm going off topic here, but I, I'm going to spit it out. Don't worry, I'll end up playing on this question. <laughs> how, is, um, how is communicating to uh, recruits uh, changed and is it better or is it a little bit more of a challenge now? Do you find that this digital transformation has helped you out a little bit more? Um, you know, so yeah, um, I, I don't think it's helped me. I, I, I'm pretty much still communicating on the phone. Um, you know, a lot of kids don't want to talk anymore, they prefer text exchange, right? Um, but I think the best way to communicate, to connect, and obviously to evaluate is to talk on the phone, right? Or meet in person. Uh, our recruiting pitch is always the same. It's always about expectations, right? We want to meet the expectations of the student athlete when they get to the University of New Haven, and we want them to meet our expectations, you know, being a good person, being a good student, and, and loving basketball. So none of that has changed. Uh, there's too many ways to communicate now, right? You can get a DM on Twitter. You can get Facebook Instant Messenger. I, I've struggled with that a little bit. There's just too many ways for people to reach you and maybe too many, uh, too many different ways to reach, but – it always comes down to the interpersonal relationship that you have with people, right? And um, that's only going to happen with with your voice and I, I think in person. So it's it's changed a lot, but uh, the best way to do it is still the old school way: is to sit down and maybe have a meal and talk, and then uh, and talk on the phone. So if you are, and I'm gonna I'll I'm gonna kick it back to you, J Dub. I'm sorry. One last comment. It's a little plug um, for our for our sponsor. Um, if you are looking for a meal, Ted, there is the broccoli Rob sandwich over at uh, Provenzano's in West Haven. I did so not realize free. you had your own sandwich. Wait, I have I to. Uh, I can't believe uh, that was good. You took my line. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's no accident that Provenzano's is our sponsor. I moved around the corner from them, and I'm there way too much. <laughs> and quite frankly, my favorite sandwich is called the Napoli which is a broccoli rub, which if you're not from the region is, you know, broccolini with sausage and, and, and garlic all chopped up with provolone. So I've been eating that for a month or two when I walk in behind Rob and I watch him order. I'm like, what you just ordered? Well, he, I just said I won my sandwich. I go in the next my sandwich. 
I'll have the Rob Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> and they went and they turned around, went and made it. All I said I was I'm Rob Thompson. I can, can I tell you what. Question, no, is, that, is that because you spend a lot of money there or because they like you? I mean, that's that's the question of why you have your own sandwich. Well, it's been a great show, guys, and I'll talk to you. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Yeah. Hey, Ted, it was good seeing you again. Thanks, guys, for Thank having you. me on, and I'll go behind scenes. And by the way, no guys from Southern has their own sandwich in after them. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we thank Broccoli Rob for, for popping in. Ted, another minute or so with you before uh, before we say our goodbyes, but I just wanted to – to thank you for being on. Uh, last uh, last words for our Charger Nation who are who are listening here and 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 uh, watching as well. What's the future look like for uh, UNH basketball? Yeah, we're excited. Uh, you know, we lose some good players. Elijah Bailey and Kesley Felsor in particular had great careers and were very productive and obviously did a ton for our program. But we have two incoming freshmen that we think will be productive players. We just signed a seven foot one transfer, which will change the dynamic of our team in, in a big way and expect him to do good things. So, uh, and we have a good returning core. We have a returning guard. So yeah, we're excited. Um, I know our guys are excited. A lot will be determined by their efforts over in the off season without the assistance of coaching right now. Um, but we have really high character kids. I think that will put in the time and put in the effort and, and stay together. So yeah, we're excited about the future and uh, with a little patience, we'll, we'll be back at it. That sounds great. Ted Hotelling, men's basketball coach here at the university of New Haven. Coach, thanks for being with us. We wish you all I the best. We hope it. to see you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. You are very welcome. And I, I, I'd be remiss if we didn't mention our sponsor again, Provenzano's Deli. They are over on Sawmill Road, about a five-minute drive from our main campus in West Haven. Well, Provenzano's family-owned and operated. Uh, has been serving Charger Nation since 2013. So when you're hungry, think Provenzano's Deli. And as Dr. Z said that he's been there quite a bit, and Brock B. Rob has a sandwich. Dr. Z, how long before you have a sandwich named after you? And if so, what type of sandwich would that be? You know, I'm going to stay out of that business. That could, <laughs> that could be, uh, that could be a little crazy. Yeah. Uh, although I, I, I'm telling you, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, promote the, the Napoli every time that I, 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 I eat it way too often. I, I bought it one day for breakfast and just, you know, nibbled on it all day long. That was a great day. That was a great, they're big sandwiches. You've got different, you know, I do mine on the hard roll so I don't overeat, but even that's a lot, a lot of food. Yeah, it's a great thing. You can have lunch and then you can have the other half of the sandwich for dinner or breakfast the next morning or, or what. <laughs> exactly what I do. And I, you know, it, it's not, it's not the kind of place where I have to ask for extra garlic, which is what I normally do. Uh, yeah. I moved to the right part of the country where, where I love uh, how they, how they make things here. And, and, you know, President Kaplan, I'll go have lunch, and he'll often tell him to, tell him to hold the garlic. I'll say, take all his garlic, it, to, to my wife's you know chagrin now that she's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we thank the Provenzano family for being part of our Charger family, and we thank them for sponsoring our show. As we start to wrap up the the program here, Doctor Z, what what stands out to you with our with our interview with Coach? You know, let's bring uh, bring Broccoli Rob back in here to wrap this up. And, and as he comes back in, I would say to you how. Uh, if I had one closing comment, I started thinking this like 10 minutes ago. This is what we get to do for a living. Yeah. This is why I went into coaching. I've never done anything else but coach or this. And I get to work with men and women like 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 Coach Hotaling every day. And it's not just the competitions. It's not just the practices. It's the camaraderie. It's the intellectual growth. I mean, this is one of the most well-read individuals I've ever met. And uh, I, I'll admit, I, I'm cheating a little bit because I go to him these days when I can't read all the time. Go, what are you reading? What are you doing? And he feeds my mind, and that's what that's what coaching and higher education is all about. Rob, uh, you guys have a connection as well with Coach Hotelling, as you know, he's from upstate New York, and you live in in upstate New York. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's a bond between it because we we like to say that we we both are, uh, you know, we're from uh, God's country up here. You know, unless you've been up here, you know, it's just good people. You know, Ted and his family are just legends, and there's a lot of respect for him and his dad's his brothers. It's, you know, they're a basketball family that's really, really well known in a good basketball market. So um, we're lucky to have him at UNH. I tell him that all the time. He doesn't like me saying it, but I, I mean it. You know, he does it for the right reasons. You can tell that. And he's, he's all about the character of the young men. But beyond that is, is uh, I talked about his mind and the books, but uh, beyond that is his knowledge of the game. And he comes from that. Anytime someone comes from a, 
basketball family like that, I love to just get into the details with those guys, and they blow you away. You know, they humble you in a hurry. You didn't realize you you knew so little about the game until you talked to talk to, to to people like Coach. Yeah, Ted yeah. is uh, as, as as Rob alluded to. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Famer at uh, Albany where he played. And uh, led them to the uh, NCAA Division Three tournament, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, he's he has a, a great history behind him. One of the all-time great scorers and and uh, defenders in the in the Great Danes history, that's for sure. Doctor Z, of course, you as you alluded to before, you've seen a lot of big-time basketball, and it starts right when your previous stop at, as AD at Kansas, right? I mean, that's Kansas and basketball are synonymous. You've had a chance to see basketball here at the Division Two level here at the University of New Haven with the 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 excitement and the run that that the Chargers did had for the NET NE10 tournament. I know it's comparing apples to oranges, so I'm not going to ask you to do that, but what is your impression now that you've been here for a little while and had a chance to see what Division 2 basketball is all about? Okay, you didn't know you just gave me a layup. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we've that, talked, that's like a lob, and I'm going to let you dunk uh, it at the rim. Well, you know, this is what we've talked about in my past, but we haven't gone deep enough to where I grew up in Hayes, Kansas. It's it's lovingly referred to as Hayes, America, the home of Fort Hayes State University, where my father was a professor for thirty some years and their first d- distinguished scholar, and 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 a bunch of good stuff like that. The claim to fame of Fort Hayes State is strong athletics. Uh, in 1976, they built a coliseum. Uh, that seats 6,500 people and standing room only as many as 8,000. And so as I was growing up from the age of four to to my first year playing football there, I never missed a football or basketball game that I can remember. And you'd get in for like four bucks and your parents could drop you off and you could run. Now, when I was four, they didn't. But as I got into upper grade school, you'd go in and sit with your teachers, you know, at these games. And and Fort Hayes was a dominant NAIA school, NAIA Division One at that time. Uh, I grew up watching what then became Division II basketball from cradle to, to, to college. And, uh, you know, they had a run there of being 34 and five at one point and playing in the NAIA national championships and this and that. And uh, won several, if I remember correctly, but most back, I can't remember the year, won the, they may be the only NCAA Division II team to go 34 0 and win it all. And, uh, uh, so I've been around it throughout my life, and this just brings me right back. It's it's not the size of the dog in the fight; it's the fight in the dog. And the the games I've been able to see here, the way coached coaches his team, I have absolutely loved every minute of it. It's been phenomenal to watch. I know our alums know that. I, it, we're live streamed most of the time. You can get all of this basketball you want, and I would recommend that people do. Rob, you've seen the evolution of, of UNH basketball from your time as a student and having grown up in, in West Haven. What do you think about the how it's how it's grown and, and it's uh, how it looks for the future? Well, I just the evolution of Dr. Z changing his shirt has just that has really stood out to me about it with this podcast. <laughs> I wanted people to be able to differentiate between you know the last five podcasts. This podcast, number five or six. I, I changed my shirt. I, I, I just think I just it was like weekend at Bernie's. We're just sitting there having your wave, you know. Uh, I, you know, I you know it's just it's it's not the easiest at D two to recruit. Um, there's no doubt about it. You know, you got to get some special kids in there, and you you just can't be desperate to get the the any kid in there. You got to get the right kids, and Ted has gone above and beyond getting the right kids. You know, and um, I think it's evident when you see the kids play the how they perform, how they are. Um, I would take a group of them every year down to the NBA and work some tournaments uh, for me down in the city. And they're just great kids and they're going to be great alums and um, really proud to have uh, those, those kids part of our program. And, you know, there's, there's a lot stacked against it as a former D2 athlete. I know it, you know, you got a chip on your shoulder and uh, you know, 10 has an authenticity about him, and he was one of those guys too, you know? So I think that that makes it easier and kids can relate to that. And, you know, as an administrative staff and people that work with Ted on the fundraising side, it's, you know, alums love them and he just has a way with people. So, you know, I can't, I can't reiterate it enough how lucky we are to have that guy and have him stick around for 10 years. But I, 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 I give all the credit to his wife who's kept, kept him here and, and the key to the Wallingford public library, I'm sure is a major perk for that too. 
<laughs> yeah, an, an impressive bookshelf, no doubt, for Ted uh, today. I, I think that the, that he's won. I think he's won the background so far for everyone we've had on. Yeah, he's got it, hands down. All right, no boys, problem. I'm going to jump out. All right, all right. I yep. think it's key. This point though, about Ted being here for ten years, you just don't find that a lot of places, and and a lot of our coaches have been here for that long or longer. Yeah, Doctor Z, I, I, you bring up a good point. I mean, when you when when a lot of ads come in, they want to change things and put a stamp on things and bring their own people in. What was your philosophy when you got here to UNH? Mine has always been that you you come in and you watch and you become a part of the culture before you change the culture. I, I was just brought up that way, not just by my parents and grandparents, but by Coach Snyder at Kansas State. And once you understand what that culture is, you can add your own your own spice to it. And, uh, you know, my I mean this, my greatest sense of success is if I can come in and, and inherit coaches and help them succeed at a level beyond what they were doing, I just think that's fundamentally being a good person in our business. And I know that flies in the face of what fans are used to seeing across the country, but that I believe that's our purpose. If you're in this to be an educator and a teacher at heart, it's not just about the student athletes. It's about your coaches and those coaches and those staff members that you, you inherit. uh, They're, they're real people with real families and to get to know them, as you obviously can tell that Ted and I've gotten pretty close and uh, uh, you know, love what he does and, and and his purpose. And if I can help him be even more successful than he's been, then that's, that's a true definition of success. Yep. I would agree with you hundred percent. He, he's a great person to talk to. I, it was great to have him on the podcast. He has a, a very interesting worldview. We didn't even get a chance to, to get into it, but he's played professionally overseas. He's played in Europe. You know, he's, he's been a part of other cultures. He's helped send some of our former student athletes on to play overseas as, as he alluded to. And we are very lucky, as Rob pointed out, that we've had him for 10 years. And, you know, hopefully he'll be around for a lot longer. And we're getting close, doctors. We're getting close to that first NET, NE10 championship. Could have been this year. Maybe it'll yeah. be next. I think he's got it right in his sights. The fact he's in there fighting for it almost every year is pretty significant. Yeah. An amazing run this year. All the overtime games. It was really incredible. And, you know, it just makes us, we talk about it, it just makes us miss sports that much more. And we hope that you know, live sports, especially at the college level, will be back very, very soon. I know, I know you, I, I feel that way. I think we all feel that way, Dr. Z. You know, it's, it's everyone, we, we had a, a volleyball alum on our Mental Health Monday yesterday, and she'd been through some tough things in her life. It, her, her name's Kara Brown and had, is beaten Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and was sharing that with our student athletes. And she talked about how that, I hope she, uh, you know, forgives me for telling her story here, but that she talked about that situation in her life being, she had to hit the pause button and she compared it to what we're doing now collectively hitting the pause button. And we're all learning from that. But one of the things I'm learning is, is I, I, I do think we, we take sports to a level that maybe it shouldn't be at times, both in terms of monetary, uh, uh, expense and, 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 and how much we can almost worship it. But there's a level of sport, sporting activity that's just right. And that's what I find here at the University of New Haven. We're, we're right there in that sweet spot. And uh, I'm finding as the months move along here, how much I miss the competitions, the practices, and more than anything, just the camaraderie and the collegiality of being around the young people and our coaches. Well, we'll all hope for the best and uh, things will get better. We know it. We'll all get through it together. And before before you know it, we'll all be back on campus together again, which would be fantastic. That that day's coming. That yep. day's coming. Until then, until we're in a studio together to do the bod- the podcast, yep. we're doing it here uh, remotely. And uh, Dr. Z, thanks for being here. And, and for Coach Hotelling, we appreciate him joining us here on the podcast as well. Thanks again to our sponsor, Provenzano's Deli in West Haven. And thanks to everyone in Charger Nation who tuned in today. For Dr. Z, for our producer, Broccoli Rob Thompson, for our executive producer, John Mays, I'm J.W. Stewart. Thanks for watching the Dr. Z and J.W. podcast. We'll see you next time. Ha, ha, ha.
Are you coming back? We're not live anymore, right, Rob? No. Uh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs>